G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to my 2022 Brisbane preview. Been really looking forward to doing this. A lot of news to take in during the preseason, and I think this may be a little bit biased because you know I'm a Lions man that we can go really close to going all the way this year. Now, what I do have on the screen here is an exclusive photo that was taken by a Bigfooty member, Section 5. Big shout out to you. Thank you very much for giving me permission to share this photo. This is actually a photo of the Brisbane probable side. So they've been doing a lot of match sims lately. Lots of the players actually went back to training really early or did lots of extra training during the off season, which has now allowed them to focus a lot more on the skill side of things and get right into these match sims. So what you'll notice here is that there are a couple of new names that maybe we didn't see in the A side this year, but keep in mind that there are some players that are currently getting managed. Jared Lyons is in this side being managed at the moment. I think they are managing Dev Robinson, so I think he probably comes into this side as well. And Big Darcy Fort, another recruit from the off-season, I see playing round one as well. So who are the guys that probably go out of this side? Well, for me, if I pick three blokes, it's probably Archie, Mitch Robinson, and Eli Smith that will go out of this side. But again, that's just a little bit of guesswork. This is the actual A side at the moment. I know that after half time, uh, Zorko didn't take any further part in the match. Harry Sharp came into that A, a side. Maybe a couple of others may have switched around a couple of those fringe players. But from the back line, you got Starsvich, Andrews Gardner. No surprise there whatsoever. Rich, Adams, and Zorko. So a little bit of a surprise that Zorko was playing off the half back. It has been floated a little bit, but I still can't see it, particularly with that Achilles issue. I see him probably playing more of that half forward, maybe even forward pocket type role. But who knows, he did play there in the first half. Just hoping that's just to get some Ks in his league. So now this is where it gets really interesting in the midfield. You'll see some colored magnets here. That's obviously who they're rotating with. So you've got Answorth, Archie, and Mitch Robinson with the yellows there, obviously rotating off the wing. We look in the middle there, you've got Big O, He's rotating with Danaher, but again, I expect Darcy Fort to be playing round one. I think what they're doing at the moment is pegging McInerney up against Fort. Other stages, though, some other match sims, they have played in the same side just to develop a little bit of that synergy. You see the blue magnets there. You've got Neil Berry and Eli Smith. I think Eli Smith probably goes out of that side, and Jared Lyons comes in, but really good news for Berry there that he's starting in the middle. You've got Zach Bailey, Rayner, and Cockatoo with the red magnets, so looks like they're basically rotating forward to mid, and I'm hearing some really good reports, particularly about Bailey and Rayner. And then we see Mr. Huey McCluggage, who has a green magnet. Basically, what that means is that he's been rotating from the wing to the inside to that half forward role. So that's what that means. That's why we've got those different colored markers there. Cameron, Danaher, and McCarthy to round out the forward line. Then we've got Kitty Coleman, who did come back on in place of Zorko in that halfback role. And I think that's where Kitty Coleman will play. And then we've got Robinson, as I've already mentioned, Eli Smith and Cockatoo as well. So uh, look, there's going to be a fair bit of competition in the Brisbane Lions midfield this year. Let's have a quick listen to what Jared Berry and Jared Lyons have said about it. Probably 20 blokes who can go through the midfield. So you've got to sort of squeeze maybe eight blokes, 10 if you're lucky, into that sort of 20. So there's a lot of guys that are, haven't even played senior footy yet that are, are really knocking down the door and keeping uh, guys like me, Lockie, um, Barry, and, and Huey honest. Um, even O who's got a bit of competition and uh, big Darcy Ford who's come in. So yeah, it's a really exciting time. There's always been good competition in our midfield, no doubt about that. With um, Especially this preseason, there's a lot of guys rolling through and there's a lot of guys actually that are playing in the um, in the yellow side that are, are pushing to get in there. Um, so yeah, there's always competition for spots, and um, that only makes you better, I guess. Um, you, you're knocking on the door of, of someone's spot, and they've got to improve, otherwise they get passed. So lots of competition for spots here at Brisbane. But before we talk about the midfield, let's go all the way back, and we'll start off in defence. Now I think there's only going to be one premium defender that's super coach relevant for the Lions this year and that's Daniel Rich. Rewarded with his first All-Australian Blazer last year, Richie had a career best average of 107, beating his previous best average of 96.8 by over 10 points. And I don't think that he gained enough respect last year for those efforts and remained a pod for the entire season. Now, I'm expecting a similar role to last year. May even have more of a monopoly on the kickouts, given the fact that Grant Birchall has retired. We know what his strengths are. Everyone knows about that. His lethal left foot, 
kicks it long, kicks it accurately. As I said, should take the large majority of the kick-ins and he's really flourished under Chris Fagan. He has mentioned in his first meeting with Fagan that Fags told him that he thought that his best football was in front of him and that gave him a lot of confidence, motivation and I think that Fags' words really have rung true. Now the issue for me selecting Rich as a starting pick this year is that we're probably playing maximum price for him. Now I don't think there's going to be a big drop off in his scoring. I still think that he can score really really well but for me he's probably more of an upgrade target. When you're getting Aaron Hall at a cheaper price for example, someone like Jake Lloyd who we've been able to select back there for years and years with consistent high averages I just think that there are some safer picks, but I'll certainly look to bring in Rich possibly at some stage of the season when hopefully we get him at a more friendly price because 582700 we are really, really paying up and it can always be a little bit dangerous, particularly with someone at Rich's age selecting him off a career best season, but still really, really like the pick, but I think there are some better options to actually start off with. And one other quick thing to note is that there was someone at training the other week, someone that I was talking to on Big Footy, that did mention that he did possibly come off with a slight calf issue. So I don't think anything's been reported from the club, but just something to keep an eye out for. The next man could be a really sneaky mid-price option. He's been lighting it up the preseason. It's Kadean Kitty Coleman. Now, I am super excited about this bloke. He's priced at 263200 got some nice DPP status. He's a former academy pick coming into his third year in the system, has played predominantly forward in his short career, but late last year, we did see a role change where he switched to defense, and that's continued into the preseason match sims. He's absolutely lighting it up. I know everyone is, aren't they, in the preseason, but he's playing in the A side, and he's not only being talked up by Brisbane supporters, but also by other players, and here's a quick snippet from Robbo's Rip Through a Podcast. Um, Kitty Coleman's put a lot of work How, in he, He's my smoky for most improved this Breakout, year. Yeah, yeah, big time. Now, if you look back to his last three games of 2020, which included two finals, he had scores of 87 versus West Coast, 90 versus Melbourne, and a 77 versus the Dogs. And remember, these last two scores won't show up on the Supercoach app or count towards his season average because obviously the finals are outside of the Supercoach season. So his Supercoach average last year was a measly 48.4. So nothing to write home about, but I see a lot of meat on the bone with his new role change. And I think he can improve his 2021 average by 35 to 40 points. He's really worked hard in his running and endurance. And in match sims, he's been linking off off half back with the one twos, delivering the ball well, and really running hard both ways. And remember, another big advantage that I touched on earlier is his handy DPP status. There seem to be a few potential forward defenders swings with likes of your DeConning, uh, Skinner, Will Kelly, even a McCartan, who's just been added to Supercoach. So just love his flexibility. Great value, new super coach friendly role. As I said, improved endurance, added strength in the gym, good job security, DPP status as we've touched on. It just means that he should be a really good stepping stone. There's certainly no guarantees that the pick works, but for me, his upside's too good to ignore and currently a swing man in my side. Next man is a forgotten man, really highly rated inside the four walls at Brisbane, but outside, you probably wouldn't have heard much about him and it's Noah Answorth. Now, I thought I'd give this man a quick shout, 246800 in defence, so a bit of an awkward price there. Very, very injury prone, but looking really good now, running freely, and he is playing in the A side in the match sim, so he's rotating between a wing and also that half-back position, but he is injury prone, as I mentioned, you know, groins, hips, back, and it dates all the way back to his junior years because he's a really courageous player. He did go back with the flight and basically broke his back, so that set him back a lot. Didn't get drafted in his draft year, but he did as a 19-year-old. He's just highly competitive, loves to tackle, got great endurance. He's a good runner and just loves the contest. So, look, he could be a player that could break out, but probably for me, it's a little bit too risky. If he was around the 200k mark and you're saving about 46 grand on him, then sure, I'd highly consider him. But at this stage, he's probably just a little bit pricey for me. But don't be surprised to see him go at least 350 plus by the end of the season. On to the midfield now, and we'll start with the most expensive player that you can select from Brisbane this year. It's Jared Lyons. What a lovely gift this was from the Gold Coast Suns. Hasn't he really flourished in Lyons colours? I can't get my head over that. But anyway, I think he's a really underrated player. Just seems to get the job done 
every week. Had a really solid last year, you super coach wise, finishing in the top 10 averaging midfielders last year. And going into 2022, he is the ultimate pod selection currently in only 1.6% of sides. Now, I think the reason for that is justified, and it's probably due to his lack of upside. I don't see his CBAs increasing with the amount of blokes that are pegged to run through there. And if anything, I think they may slightly decrease. Remember, we've got a fit Lockie Neal this year, a fit Jared Berry. Bailey, Rayner looking to run through there. But at the same time, I don't see a huge fall in his scoring as well. And I think he's more than capable of going a 110 to 115. But with Neil at a bargain price and so many other good Uber options this year that seem pretty safe, I'm going to pass for now, but may possibly look at him as an upgrade target during the year. On to a man that I think has the potential to have a Brownlow medal around his neck one day. He's a Rolls-Royce from Brisbane, Huey McCluggage. Now with Huey, it's pretty simple. The issue for him is that he doesn't get enough time on the inside. Now, if he had the role that Sam Walsh had in 2021, he could produce Sam Walsh numbers. I'm really, really confident that this bloke is just elite. He's the fittest player at the club, as it says there under the preseason news section, and is absolutely turning heads on the training track. Chris Fagan said that he thinks that this bloke can take his game to another level, but it is all about that role. We saw his magnet at the start of the video. It was green rotating from the wing to the half forward, playing a little bit on the inside. He's just a little bit all over the place. So unless I see him playing some guaranteed inside minutes and enough inside minutes, I just can't select him at this stage. But the day that he does move into that position full time is the day that this man will become an uber elite. The next man needs absolutely no introduction. He's the 2020 Brownlow medalist hampered by injury last year. It's Lockie Neal. An absolute lock in my side at the price. We know what this bad man can do in fit. He's a disposal pig, an absolute scoring machine. And given the fact he's in ripping shape and hasn't missed a beat this preseason, for me, he is a no-brainer. We've paid over 700k to start this man before. And personally, I think he'll finish in the top five averaging mids in 2022. Aside from injuries last year, there was a lot going on off the field, you know, starting a new family, he and his wife Jules being so far away from her family in WA, but things seem settled now, they've got the support in place that they need, and I think he's in a much better place mentally. And remember, in the qualifying final against the D's, he reminded us of his capabilities with a 46 disposal game, which netted him a score of 152. So unless he's got some sort of preseason setback, he will not leave my side and he is currently in 49.8% of sides. We've got a lot of people going through different positions, a lot of people, you know, in some of the best um, condition I've seen. You know, Locke looks amazing. Mm, he does, um, he is flying. Next man is my favorite player in the competition. I've already put out a player profile video on him. It goes for about 15 minutes, so make sure you check that out. It is, of course, Jared Berry. Now, I'm a big fan of the Jared Berry selection this year. As I mentioned, I did put out a preseason video on him. I will just show you some of the slides here quickly. Some of the cons, his durability, kicking efficiency isn't great. His consistency with his scoring can have a low floor at times. I'd love to see him have more of a scoreboard impact, improve his goal kicking accuracy, and he's never had 30 plus disposals in a game. But some of the pros are his endurance, his work rate, his versatility, strength, excellent leader, great resilience, and he does come at a bargain price of 268,500. Keeping in mind that his 2021 starting price was 521K. We can see here as well from rounds three to seven in 2020, not a huge sample size, but this table shows the damage and the impact that this man can actually have when he's fit. So during rounds three to seven, he did average 112, five and a half tackles, almost nine uncontested, getting close to 10 contested for an average of 18. So again, his 2022 preseason, he did return one week earlier than required. He's running well, was third in a 3K time trial, not in a modified program, completing all sessions, body's feeling great, and currently injury free. Now there's some other players that you may choose to put in this position, maybe rookies such as your Horn, Francis, your Wards, Erasmus, or these types where you're saving 100K. But given the fact that we already have seen this man go an 84.9 and a 97.1 in 2019 to 2020, given the fact he's really fit now, I think that he can come back bigger and better than ever and be a really solid selection for us this year. A great cash cow, and I can't see him not reaching the 450K mark at a minimum. I had uh, Rachel coming into the club and she's really been beneficial for me, especially um, in terms of my breathing and, and being able to recover quicker. So then repeat efforts and stuff like that. 
a um, little bit more. And then I guess on top of that, um, actually training with um, Mark Stone a little bit, a little bit um, closer, and we've we've been focusing on just the same thing. That, um, I guess in the scrimmage and stoppage, being able to have a few efforts and explode out. So. What do you feel you can add, Bez? Because you've been in and out of the team because of your body and your injuries. I think the the biggest one for me is my hunt and being able to, I guess, do that um, in an offensive way and, and also defensive. So um, that's, I guess, my strength and um, I'm looking forward to bringing that. That's what I've been training. I've been um, really honing in on that this preseason and, and trying to make um, my weapon my weapons. Next up, we have one of the most improved most humble and hard-working players in AFL, the Big O, Oscar McInerney. Now, as a solo ruck, I think that the Big O can absolutely break out in 2022. He's got everything going for him, coming into that right age bracket, got some experience under his belt now, got a great midfield under him, and he also presents a little bit of value because, remember, in round two, he did have an injury-affected game, and I was actually at this game where he scored a 45 against the Cats, so I remember he really battled and soldiered on but his ankle was just buggered. So he did miss round three, came back in round four against the Bulldogs and actually managed to hit the ton. Now, his scoring up until the buys, yeah, it wasn't too fantastic and there wasn't much to write home about. But here are some of his scores, or well, all of his scores, after the buy. So round 14 against the Roos, pretty low one with a 72. Then he goes a 115, 114, 106, 91, 148, 113, 120, 131, 96, a 127, and then a pretty low game with an 82 to finish off in the semi-final against the Dogs. So there's a lot to like about that, particularly his form after the buy. But there is one issue, and this is all related to Eric Hipwood going down. And what we have done in the offseason is recruit Darcy Fort. So he hasn't seen a whole heap of AFL time Fort, but at a VFL level, he was one of the premier rucks of the competition. And Oscar, even in his own words, has said that he's looking forward to really pairing up with Fort. And I'm not sure what the split in the ruck is actually going to be because both of these players are also capable forwards. So that's the main issue this year in regards to the big O breaking out is how much time will he actually play in the ruck? Now, this is my theory. I think that given the fact that I think Fort will be in our round one side, I think that the big O is a big chance to get some forward status. And come round six or come round 12, I think he could be a potential forward option. And I'm thinking round 12. The reason why I say that is because Eric Hipwood is due back around 14, uh, around round 14, sorry. So given that time frame, round 12, we may be able to get him. Fort may go out of the side. And then Big O may really start to increase those ruck minutes with someone like a Joey Danaher just relieving every now and then when the big man needs a break. But that's the main concern, as I said, Darcy Fort being in the side. Let's hear from the Big O himself about the current ruck situation at the Lions. Um, new ruckman on the list this year with Darcy. How's he fitted in? Yeah, Darcy's been phenomenal. Um, straight away, seamlessly fitted in. I reckon me and Darcy, been, we've had some opportunities and Matt seems to work together and there's some really good chemistry going on. And, uh, he hasn't missed a beat since coming up in the first of Jan. Last year you were using forwards like Joey or maybe Tommy Fort or someone to sort of back, back up. Some ruckmen say that, you know, like we like playing the lion's share of time in the ruck. How, how do you find that compared to when you're having to split 50-50? So? Oh, I've got no qualms, whatever my role is. I've, I've said it before, I'm just living the dream. And whether I'm playing 30 for 30%, 40%, it doesn't really change. We're in there to compete, bring the ball to ground, and that's as a forward, a ruck, or a sit on the pond, seeing what the game's doing and understanding what requires me at the given time. Um, so there's no, no pressure, splits or whatever. I'm not looking into numbers going, oh, I need to be this or I need to be that. I'm just out there loving the game, and hopefully it'll be really big for you because he, he's making some waves at the minute. So take from that what you will. But for me, though, probably too risky to start the big fella. The first forward we'll take a look at is a man that has star power written all over him. I've said it once, I'll say it again. If they redid this draft, he would easily be in the top five selected players. It's Zach the Rat Bailey. There's been a lot of positive preseason reports coming out of the Lions camp about Zach, and he does seem set to take his game to another level. He doesn't need a lot of the ball to be damaging, hits a scoreboard on clutch occasions, has a great burst of speed, and can basically play anywhere on the ground. But I think his main issue to date from a super coach sense anyway 
is the fact that he's played so well as a forward. It's similar to a Toby Green in the sense that he could be an elite midfielder, but his value to the team may lie elsewhere. As it says in the preseason notes, however, he has attended a large number of CBAs and has been a bit of a clearance king in the match sims. He seems to be rotating with Rayner, but come the start of the season, I don't know what he's forward mid split is actually going to be so therefore it is hard to select him over some like a Heaney who we're pretty sure is going to be playing that permanent midfield role and more resting in the forward line but look he could be on par with someone like a Zach Butters at his price point and as a general rule if he goes above 22 disposals he reaches three figures so with a 22 plus disposal rate last year he had scores of 110, 124, 133 84 and a 102 so four out of five occasions he did manage to reach those three figures so with some increased cbas he could push towards 100 average i'd love to start him but he does have big competition with you know your dagoe your taron thomas butters heaney as i mentioned before and possibly even someone like an adam trelaw so love him as a player really really rate him but i'm just not sure if he's going to get the mid minutes required for him to be a really solid selection for us this year. Now we've got a former number one draft pick whose season was cruelly wiped out with injury last year. Did his ACL, but he has hit the preseason track in ripping form, looking like a new player. It's Cam Rayner. Now I think people's main issue with selecting Rayner is the fact that we've never really seen him in this role before. And apart from some positive training reports, and believe me, there have been a lot of positive training reports. Dom Fay put out some tweets the other day with their match sim and it was Rainer, Rainer, Rainer. Apparently he was absolutely everywhere. But the issue is that we've got no data or no tangible evidence to suggest that he is actually going to break out. His three highest super coach scores are a 125 in 2020, 114 also in 2020, and a 104 back in 2018. And he's never been a really big accumulator with a highest career disposal count of 22. And again, that was back in his debut year. And he's actually only gone above 20 twice. But of course, as we know, he's been played predominantly as a forward. So we certainly need to take that into consideration. And I think a lot of this pick really is a bit of a gut feel. And look, I'll admit, originally I assumed coming off an E that he'd be playing mainly forward just to you know, ease himself back into football, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And Chris Fagan seems very keen for him to do some damage in the middle of the ground. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him play that stringer type role of 2021, starting in the middle at times, then pushing hard forward. And look, the knock has always been on his running and his endurance, but he's worked extremely hard on that to get it to the level that's required to play that midfield role. But one of the main questions for me is how much time will he actually get in there? I'm assuming that he rotates sort of mid forward with Zach Bailey, but the split between them is anyone's guess at this stage. And another question to ask ourselves is, how will he perform against AFL quality mids? As we know, the Lions match sims, they've been a possibles versus a probable setup. And coming up against an Oliver and a Betracker is a whole different ball game compared to playing against, say, a Tom Berry and a Reese Matheson, who are currently in the Brisbane B side. So look, at his price, the upside seems there. But, you know, they've also got Kerno, Cogs and Co., that are under or at Rainer's price point, And that's what makes this a really tough decision. His highest price point was 387,900, and that was in round 18, 2020. So look, you'd probably think with his new role that he gets to 400 at a minimum. But again, this is a lot of guesswork. I think his ceiling should rise. And I see him going around an 80 to 85. And if all things go well, he gets enough CBAs. He's got the potential to go 90 plus. Will he, won't he? I can't answer that, but if you're looking for a potential breakout forward or even a nice stepping stone with good job security, he could be the man for you. So I think what we need to do is see how he actually goes against that AFL quality opposition that I was talking about before in the official practice match. And if he's able to display the same promise that we've seen in the intra clubs, then he may be really, really hard to leave out of your side. So for me, the verdict is a bit of a wait and see. And again, you will hear from Dane Zorko a little bit during this video. Here's some quick thoughts just to end on Cam Rayner. And then obviously Cam, who has come back off an ACL and looks really, really yeah. good. So um, if anyone's come down and watched our practice matches, you'd be like, who's this new recruit? Like yeah. Cam just looks like a different player. Good. So, And we'll quickly touch on three more players. We've got Nakai Cockatoo, 265,600 forward, a really talented type player, but we know what his durability like, terrible injury history but apparently has been training really well. His body looks like it's the best it's ever been. But again, 
I just can't trust it. But wouldn't be surprised to see him have a career best year. We've got Darcy Wilmot to the far right there. Our first round rookie choice, 139,800 available as a defender. Mr. Pepsi Max himself, a real character, a great leader already at his young age. But I think the issue for Wilmot is nothing to do with his talent and his competitiveness. It's simply that there's lots of competition for the particular role that he's playing. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him play games at some stage of the season. He has been really impressing at training so far. But I think at this stage, he'll probably have to rely on injury or just show some exceptional form at reserves level. And in the middle, we've got our captain, Dane Zorko. Unfortunately, I think his best days are over in a super coach sense. His body is starting to let him down, got some Achilles problems. You can actually hear from the man himself here. What's, what's your preseason look like so far to date? Yeah, well, it's probably been a little bit inconsistent, hasn't it? Um, 2019, I had a really, really good preseason. 2020 was going really good until sort of had a little bit of Achilles issues, and that sort of just tampered me. Yeah. For the last, hampered me for the last two and a bit years. Your chilies. Yeah. That's I mean, not it's good. Get, yeah, it's been frustrating, but just a couple of little niggles in there that have probably stopped me from doing more than what I would have liked to this season. So not great reports coming out there about Zorko. And I did hear from a supporter that was at training that he did come off the ground, apparently heard a pop somewhere. So I'm not too sure how accurate that was. I can't confirm that, but that's news that I did hear coming out of training. So that's my take on the super coach relevant players from Brisbane going into 2022. Let me know who you're going to select down there in the comments section. And if there's anyone that you thought that I missed or you want some extra information on, feel free to let me know also. I will be putting out a lead code within the next week and also feel free to join up to the super coach with DR group. And I will put that code up on the screen now. So apart from that, take care guys. Hope that you're well and I'll see you soon. Bye.